as much as trauma is subjective and I would say that, you know, it, it wrecks havoc in, in everybody. Yeah. Um, when we talk about racialization, there's that extra layer, right? Yeah. Because we're not just talking about the individual traumatic experience or the collective, but we're also talking about the ancestral trauma, the intergenerational trauma, when we think about systemically as well. I think we also have to be honest with ourselves that for decades, we have been living in a system that is not meant for Indigenous and Black and racialized yeah. bodies, right? So when we take that into consideration, I think it's really important to recognize that our approaches do need to keep that in consideration mm -hmm. of what has happened to the person, but what has happened to their people yeah. and what continues to happen to their people. It's about the opportunity to rewrite a new story, yeah. a story of hope, uh, a story of resilience, a story of coming back to to our true selves, wow. right? And and being able to celebrate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Hi, Kayla. <laughs> Hi, Sabrina. How are you I'm, doing this afternoon? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm so excited that we are relaunching Maps Canada, Maps Canada podcast. And yes. you're our first guest in the relaunch. Yay! Hey, I'm very, very <laughs> grateful and humbled by that. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. I, I'm just honored to have you as our first guest for the relaunch. Um, just because, yeah. like, you know, we hear a lot of voices in this space, but they're not really a lot of diverse voices. And I think this is such a topic that I don't hear being talked about enough or at all. Absolutely. So uh, I'm really excited. Yeah. So I'm just going to introduce you and please add if there's anything I'm missing. Um, For so sure. it's so excited yeah. to have Kayla Brelove here. Uh, she's a clinical traumatologist, uh, psychedelic assisted therapist, works with individuals and organizations to increase their awareness and understanding of trauma, racial trauma, and adverse childhood experiences. Kayla brings her re brings reflection and profound change in one's recovery journey while guiding organizations in the reflection of how their privilege and own lens can play out within their role in the workplace. I wish you were um, present during my previous workplace. <laughs> <laughs> just <a> <laughs> such important work. Um, with over 10 years of clinical experience, Kayla specializes as well in nutritional psychology and psychedelic assisted therapy as a clinical supervisor for those seeking licensing in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Kayla also dedicates her time in supporting graduate students through Brie Love's weekly free counseling clinic and community counseling program where individuals seeking counseling therapy can engage in one-on-one -on -one mental health counseling for free. When she is not providing counseling therapy or consultation work, Kayla enjoys contributing to CBC Morning Moncton and PEI, as well as their mental health columnist, while also spending time with her two children under five and partner of 15 years. And just to add, also board of directors from Maps Canada. So you, I, yeah. I don't know where your time, you take all your time for all this work, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And I guess because we're in 2023, it's actually 11 years. So I was able to celebrate uh, 11 years of doing wow. this uh, in January. Amazing. Yeah, so it's been, uh, it's been a minute. Wow, yeah. amazing. <laughs> And you know what? You're still in it. I know that sometimes people get burnout in this and you're that's that's amazing to be doing this that long. I'm still in it. Yeah. Yeah. It's important work. And, uh, you know, the more that I work into this, I do realize that there's not enough of that representation. So in, in some ways it is about balancing, right, that that wellness. But as much as I think there's there's a true calling here, I really embody it. It makes sense for me. And if I can hold space for people for change, then why yeah. not? Yeah, you know? that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So tell us about your role as it relates to trauma, racialized communities, and also psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Yeah, that's a pretty that big, big uh, chunk right there. <laughs> Maybe we'll yeah. take it one at a time. <laughs> so let yeah, so let's start sort of in the world of traumatology. Yes. So my role really is, um, I think it's really important to empower people into understanding, understanding not only what trauma is, but how trauma really reflects and engages within your own self. Trauma is subjective, right? So everybody has their own story. They have their own way of how it shows up, how it communicates, how it engages ages in the world outside of ourselves as much as inside. Um, so I tend to tell people that as much as I'm a healer of words, um, it's also about holding space and being that vessel of information and really believing in that inner healer. So really helping, like, how do we activate that for you? Um, and it's also about representation. So I think in everything I do, uh, it's really using my own identity as a lens as well, uh, in order to really, um, I guess, 
appreciate and honor and not only my ancestral lineage but also the realities of what we don't talk about in in community yeah uh, when it comes to, I guess, if we move into uh, the, the the psychedelic space, uh, it's again that same thing about representation, and really, I think it's part of like the healing as well of of bringing it back to a lot of our indigenous and black and racialized communities. There's a lot of those communities uh, that that was part of their ancestral practice and, and, you know, through colonialism and enslavement and, and all of these historical sort of um, traumatic experiences and, and traumatic stress responses, uh, we found ourselves sort of losing that. So it's also about bringing it back, like the journey back to ourselves, but our true selves. Uh, and also just the, the, the importance of, of safety and accessibility. I think that's a huge thing um, with this huge wave of just this psychedelic excitement and, and renaissance. I find that sometimes we kind of forget about that, that safety piece and, and what psychedelics um, historically have really been for, right, of, of, of working through grief and, and understanding the world around us. So it's really about making sure that there is that voice that as much as there's the excitement of everything that's coming through, making sure we remember, you know, where this medicine comes yeah. from um, and what its purpose truly is. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. amazing. Um, and how, uh, what is the significance of your practice being in the East Coast? Yeah, so that's <laughs> another one. Um, I find that, you know, when we when we talk about enslavement and colonialism, we, we tend to hear it more around uh, the history of, of in the U.S. or yes. the West Indies or the Caribbeans or even out, you know, out West. It's a lot around Indigenous communities. Um, and unfortunately, historically, uh, Black people become sort of invisible in, in that history as well. So the significance for me is, you know, the Atlantic Ocean. This yeah. is where the boats came right this is where it started so for me it's really profound it's 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 it resonates that this is where some of the most awful and, and heartbreaking experiences happen but for me it's also where healing can also begin um the opportunity to rewrite that story right to to recreate this legacy uh when we think about even harriet tubman yeah. and the underground railroad and bringing us it's, it it all happened on the east yeah. coast like it, it really did so um we are there's a lot of history yeah. there right there's a lot of history there's a lot of um pain but there's a lot of of culture and and things to celebrate and and resilience. We think about the African Nova Scotians um, who, you know, ancestrally in the sense of, you know, from those enslaved ships to the East Coast, they really settled here, right? And and some migrated, uh, but this is the hub. This is this is where it started, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, that's, that's the biggest passion there. And um, it's about the opportunity to rewrite a new story, yeah. a story of hope, uh, a story of resilience, a story of coming back to, to our true selves, wow. right? And, and being able to celebrate yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and how does trauma differ in racialized communities? You know, it, it, as much as trauma is subjective, and I would say that, you know, it, it wrecks havoc in, in everybody. Yeah. Um, when we talk about racialization, there's that extra layer, right? Yeah. Because we're not just talking about the individual traumatic experience or the collective, but we're also talking about the ancestral trauma, the intergenerational trauma, when we think about systemically as well. I think we also have to be honest with ourselves that for decades we have been living in a system that is not meant for Indigenous and Black and racialized yeah. bodies, right? So when we take that into consideration, I think it's really important to recognize that our approaches do need to keep that in consideration mm -hmm. of what has happened to the person, but what has happened to their people yeah. and what continues to happen to their people. Um, with that as well, it's really important as a clinician to understand that lens, not to say that white body clinicians can't hold yeah. space for racialized bodies, but it's important to have that at the front, right at the front, because there's a lot of racialized bodies. I've seen clients right in my, in my career where because they've grown up in predominant white communities, mm -hmm. they themselves are not aware of the impact and the injury that can be caused of not holding that space um, or recognizing that historically racialized bodies have had to hold space for themselves yes. of, of not necessarily having that space where they can truly process um, and really work through things. So for me, it's really important that when we talk about 
racialized therapeutic spaces. It's about being cognizant of what has happened, what continues to happen. And if I don't carry that same identity mm -hmm. of being able to recognize that even though that I'm there to, to hold space for somebody, we have to recognize what, what do I represent, right? What have I inherited, yeah. um, let's say, as a, as a white body? Um, and sometimes there's always going to be that limitation that unless you've experienced mm -hmm. racialization, recognizing that that is a piece that you may never be able to comprehend. And, and how can you make space for yourself as a white yeah. body to recognize that, right? And, and, and to notice that no matter how hard you work, there's always going to be that piece. So it's sort of like that humbling piece of, okay, I need, I need to be able to hold space. And, and, and maybe that is the limit of, of my practice. Yeah. Is this, a, yeah. is this um, an area that's a gap already when we look at trauma and racialized communities? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that in my, in my career, you know, even in New Brunswick, I think it, I'm, I'm hoping it's better now, but as of two years ago, I, I am the only black therapist in New Brunswick. That's crazy. Right? And even in PEI, right? And, you know, moving into Nova Scotia, I was actually very surprised. Uh, I really thought that because African Nova Scotians mm -hmm. and, and the history here, that there would be more of, of me around. Um, but we're actually, I think we're four racialized bodies in the entirety of, of Nova Scotia. So it continues to be a, a gap. Um, I think that there's systemic historical reasons for that, right? We also have stigmatization in our own communities that as we educate ourselves, sometimes within our communities, that is undesirable because it, it, it assumes that we are trying to be better um, than our communities. So there's, there is lateral violence when it comes to that. Um, but yeah, there, there are some significant gaps when it comes to representation within this field um, of practice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, There's a lot of talk in, in the psychedelic renaissance that we're in about access. You know, everyone's talking about, everyone knows that yeah. there's an access issue. They knows that we need it, but we're not talking about how we can kind of ensure that there's access. So can you talk about your work to improve access to racialized communities and some of the most vulnerable communities we talked about before this podcast in terms of like the homeless population? Maybe you can talk to some yeah. of those things that you're doing to help improve access to your community. Hey, we hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Now, if you want to support and become part of the psychedelic movement, feel free to donate to MAPS Canada at the link in the description below. Thank you for helping our mission to support equitable access to legal and regulated psychedelic medicines for all Canadians. Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of, of historical sort of our experiences with just medicine, substances, drugs, you know, psychedelics, there's been a lot of harm done yeah. within the racialized community. So I know that it is a trust thing. Um, you'll notice a lot that there's probably not that many racialized bodies who openly talk about mm -hmm. the use of psychedelics or or that that realm. Um, so I think that we have to honor the fact that there's there's historical background there and there's there's medical trust trauma that's there mm -hmm. as well. Um, when we think about having access, though, it, it is about educating ourselves that there is also a world beyond the war on drugs and, and before all that yeah. where, you know, racialized communities did thrive in this in this space because it was their ancestral practices, yeah. right? Um, so for me in my work, it's really about bringing that back. It's bringing access. So one of some of the examples um, I do prioritize in my work that when there's a racial body seeking support, I'm there and, and, and being supportive. And although that we're still navigating the legalities of, of certain yeah. classic psychedelics, um, I still offer preparation and integration. So even though that someone may self-disclose, um, you know, that they are using uh, psychedelics as a, as a form of, of healing, I give that opportunity for education and safety mm -hmm. because I think about it this way. They're going to be using it regardless. Right. So if I can bring it into this safe space, this space of healing, um, that might benefit their healing journey. That might help them to navigate some challenging experiences. But most importantly, it begins to, to destigmatize it as well and to see it as it doesn't have to just be a recreational or something I'm hiding. It can actually be something that I can feel has therapeutic value there. Um, some of the projects 
grants. We applied for a grant for racial trauma, right? So it's an eight week program. The hope is, is that we're able to, to utilize some protocols there and, and apply through the special access program uh, to, to bring more access and, and recognition that, you know, racial trauma and, and experiences of racialized bodies are, are real um, and have a significant impact in, uh, in their quality of life um, and their well-being. Um, in terms of vulnerable publics, more, more specifically the, the homeless population, um, we were grateful of, of being honored with a, a grant to um, to implement uh, mental health and recovery services within a shelter model. Not sure across Canada, but here on yeah. the East Coast, it's pretty much non-existent. So it's a pretty big deal for us. Um, and the way that we see this lens is really from a harm reduction mm -hmm. perspective. We're kind of thinking about the idea of, you know, if we're able to offer an opportunity to reduce symptoms of, of substance withdrawal and an opportunity to start working on some of the things that um, is creating so much trauma within the homeless population, why not, right? Um, when we're thinking about harm reduction, we're dealing with individuals that uh, have, you know, fentanyl overdoses, mm -hmm. uh, that are addicted to cocaine, addicted to meth and all of these other different, really, really harmful um, substances, including mixing that with also legalized substances yeah. through pharma, pharma, you know, the, you know, pharmacology intervention and things like that. So what we've noticed so far um, through of their own of self-disclosure for them of saying, yes, I, I use this and things like that. We've noticed a huge difference in in their ability to have from mild to no um, withdrawal symptoms, uh, breaking down of, of those barriers where they're more vulnerable and more uh, wanting to talk and to access um, counseling. So for me on a harm reduction, it's like, well, you know, the risk of overdosing in fentanyl, and we know the pandemic yeah. that's taking place across our, our country around fentanyl overdoses versus the idea of having, you know, as an example, like 250 milligrams of psilocybin, mm -hmm. like to me, the harm reduction there is 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 pretty blatantly clear uh, that we can make some pretty amazing um, benefits to to our homeless population in, in helping to reduce that sufferance and potentially also mitigate this pandemic that we see across our healthcare system and, and our country around the devastating, uh, you know, um, losses uh, to a lot of communities due to fentanyl, to the, through meth, through cocaine and, and other um, access. So for me, I'm really coming from a lens of harm reduction. And really, again, that humanistic approach of ways to activate that that inner healer, but also the the understanding and the clear data and science around what psychedelics, more at least more specifically in terms of psilocybin, uh, can do within our neurotransmitters and our receptors mm -hmm. and our serotonin, and what what kind of healing can take place at a at a molecular level. Yeah. Um, I think those are really important to bring that. Um, to the to the forefront so it's really bringing in you know ancestral teaching when with the science of today right mm -hmm. the modern science yeah so with the homeless population the focus is harm reduction so really yeah. looking and you're looking specifically at psilocybin and therapy as a means to decrease like yes. cocaine use fentanyl use so we're actually looking at our protocol is actually psilocybin and cannabis use. So cannabis specifically CBD in terms of the, the, the distillate. So we're not looking at full spectrum. We're really looking at extracting CBD. Um, and that's what we've been seeing as, as a, a pretty uh, important benefit there um, that we're seeing CBD really helping with the symptoms of withdrawal, mm -hmm. inflammation and all these different things. And then we're seeing, you know, in those cases where people are self-disclosing using psilocybin we're, we're we're paying extra attention and seeing how that's creating vulnerability mm -hmm. and it's also creating new pathways where you know in one circumstance seeing it as i don't care i'm gonna use yeah. i have these cravings this is always there ruminating to i feel this sense of peace that's coming over me and this this not need to use, but to actually be able to confront um, this this discomfort, right? Um, which to me, this that is that is human, you know. That's that's a human capacity to be able to to begin confronting these things, and it really honors that an ancestor lens of 
you know, processing grief and making sense of the world. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's, that's, that's what it is about. So yeah, we're definitely looking at it a lens of harm reduction of how do we reduce um, withdrawals? Uh, because that has been one of the feedbacks. And even in studies, you you see that withdrawals from from pretty heavy drugs, such as fentanyl and um, meth and cocaine, um, are, are pretty severe yeah. when, when you're withdrawing. Um, yet alone, when you're in the homelessness population, uh, where you're really trying to escape the traumas of everyday life, mm. right? Uh, so the withdrawals can be from moderate to high. Um, so by reducing that, it, it helps to reduce the sufferance, which probably builds a little bit more energy and, and ability to then to start confronting perhaps the, the why have I been using in the first mm -hmm. place and, and confronting those. Uh, and the psilocybin just really is a beautiful companion um, to helping the therapeutic process of bringing down that wall, seeing that vulnerability, human to human, um, and, and expediting, I guess, those, those positive pathways that can help with recovery and, and uh, maybe this is my opinion, but like true healing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you talked a little bit about um, if someone is taking, so for the racialized community, if someone's taking psilocybin on their own, that you yeah. would be there to kind of support that. So maybe talk a little bit about in your support with, you know, the preparation and the integration. What does that support look like? Yeah, so the support, it really depends on where the individual's at. Mm -hmm. um, so when it's about supporting, first and foremost, uh, for me, it's important to be transparent with my clients. You'll see it on my website and my, my biography. I do talk about that. I do psychedelic assisted therapy. And I encourage individuals that are curious about to reach out. Uh, so it starts off with psychoeducation, mm -hmm. right? Really about educating individuals about what it is and what it isn't. Um, helping to demystify a lot of the different stigma that comes with psychedelics, uh, but also making sure that there's accountability and understanding the legalities and the laws around yeah. it. So it's not about just pushing that aside. It's making very clear so that my clients understand the risk that they're taking uh, so that they can make the most informed decision mm -hmm. that's best for them. Once they're moving past that and they've made that decision of, yes, I want to incorporate this in my, in my healing, um, then it's about, again, just talking about what could take place. So we do look at what are some of the risks of, of engaging in this. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about nausea and, and mixing of different medication and stuff like that. So I really do my due diligence of, of, of checking in terms of what medications that they're using, yeah. um, what relationship they have with their medical doctor as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not a physician, so I make it very clear that there are limits to, to my practice, but having the m engagements from the other uh, healthcare spaces are, are just as important. Mm -hmm. um, then it's also about educating them of like, I will send them links to peer reviewed and like studies mm -hmm. to make sure again, it's all about inform um, and being able to be like, yeah, I feel confident about this. I see the data. I understand the data um, because that's also part of the buy-in, right? There's going to be that well what's the unknown here what if right uh, so that that is really a lot of part that psychoeducation the education piece then the preparation piece is really around safety and regulation so what I mean by regulation I mean re finding ways to regulate our nervous system so finding ways to better understand that when you're outside of your window of tolerance or when you get triggered or whatever language you want to mm -hmm. use when you're not feeling quite right of having that relationship with yourself and understanding what that might mean for you uh, because whether we want to or not like whether it's microdosing an elevated dose or a journey dose like you're going to be confronted uh, by your by those emotions so for me preparation is really important for people to understand and have a relationship with themselves of you know when this comes up for me I know what that is instead of my brain telling me push through mm -hmm. or hide yeah. right so it's about making sure they recognize you know uh, trigger versus threat I feel safe versus I don't feel safe or I feel uncomfortable versus I'm in danger. Those are really important before we start uh, because if they are confronted, we want to make sure that they feel confident of being able to navigate that, even if it's a difficult navigation. Um, because with trauma, that's the issue. We get stuck mm -hmm. and I really don't want my clients to, to, to be stuck in that, in that process. So once we get that right safety and regulation piece done, 
then we can then we can talk about integrating that psychedelic piece which is you know the trauma framework where it's we start working on coming to terms so it's really about metabolizing the experiences not just talking about it but really integrating it in sense of understanding how it's processing through your body emotionally and cognitively and you know psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy is a beautiful companion that just makes it it's almost like i think i had mentioned that before it's it's almost like training wheels right on a bike it just makes it easier so that it's like you're learning to bike right Mm -hmm. but let's let's give you the tools to make it that much easier Mm -hmm. so that you don't feel like it's an impossible thing to do and i i really believe that you know psychedelic psilocybin specifically helps with that those are the training wheels and and in saying that training wheels eventually come off yeah. right so the idea of my practice is not about you're on this and you're on this for the rest of your life it's it's very much a companion of saying you can heal yourself but hey like we're in 2023 and there are there are things that can help to yeah. make that easier for you without cookie cutting it yeah. right by by honoring your process but by reducing the the um the sufferance, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's a, and and being able to have more courage to lean into uh, in into the pain. So, yeah. So so we have that preparation piece, um, and as we implement different protocols, so I have different protocols based on the the makeup of of my clients. Uh, then we start integrating, and and that that's the fun part, mm-hmm. I think, because individuals are trying to make sense of 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 the sensations or the experiences that they're having, and it's a really beautiful thing of being able to like take that. And, and and bring it to the outside world and for them to be like, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense now. Yeah. Um, it's a beautiful thing to see that integration. Uh, but all to say, I would say, you know, preparation and integration are very, very important. People tend to say, you know, it's it's the experience itself, but preparation and integration plays just as a, a as a very big role mm-hmm. in, in the entire process. I love that yeah. you mentioned psychedelics as companion. And training wheels. Yeah. I love that analogy because, you know, a lot of people are so focused on the psychedelic and, and the drug itself, but they're not really focusing on the therapy piece is so huge. Um, yeah. And I love that you, you talk about it in that way. We kind of talked before this and preparing for the podcast about the difference between on one hand, you have a patient and you're just doing therapy which obviously is critical, important, and that you're not looking at psychedelic assisted therapy. And on one side, you have a patient and you're also including psychedelics. What do those two look like in terms of breakthrough and timeline? Yeah. So, you know, everybody is different, but in my, in my career so far, what I've noticed in terms of patterns with individuals that we don't go the psychedelic Mm -hmm. route, um, I deal with complex, right? Complex cases, trauma cases. So we're not necessarily talking about general mental Mm -hmm. health, but we're talking about some of the, you know, the, the, the at risk, right? The, the ones that really need that, that relief. Um, in, in general, I can, I can think of a couple clients of mine that working through almost five years of really, like working through to get to a level where they really feel that they're getting good management of um, the symptoms and 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 working through the sufferance and having worked through the grievance. I'm not saying that it's five years of full time therapy, mm-hmm. but it's at least you know two years of of pretty intensive therapy. Maybe a, a, a sessions here and there in in that third year, and then two years again a pretty intensive. Yeah. And intensive to me is you know you're starting weekly, going bi weekly. Um, less intense would be monthly sessions, but it, it's still pretty frequent. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that practice, what I've noticed, which was pretty <laughs> amazing, but again, I, I, I hope to be able to, to showcase that in, in some of the studies and observational studies. Um, but I had an individual in particular starting to work with them. And within a year, they showcase the same outcomes as my clients of five years, yeah. which to me just blows my mind that we're able to not only support people in healing, but we're able to give them their life back and shave like four years of work to be able to get to a place where they can say, I feel again, I feel like I'm living again, Mm -hmm. that I'm part of the fabric of society in this world. I feel connected again, not always in this hyper or hypo arousal or dissociative, disconnected, numbing type of phase, Mm -hmm. right? Survival. Um, So to me, that that's such a humbling and I'm so grateful to be able to see that, but that would be my, my experience and my example of 
how a vast difference in even the time it takes. So when I'm thinking about our healthcare system, when I'm thinking about how our systems are not working right now and and people are, you know, I have clients saying I've been in therapy for 20 years, for 15 years. And it's like, whoo, man, like, you know, um, there's a lot there's a lot of hope there mm-hmm. um uh, hopefully if you know if government and all that are, are really listening and, and looking at the data there's real hope to really revolutionize and, and really radically change the way we see healing in a way that doesn't that can can also appreciate science right um but that also honors things that have been here even before we've mm-hmm. been here mm-hmm. you know yeah yeah so that's been I pretty mean, amazing to see that's really exciting for psychiatrists for mental health in general when you look at that example that you've seen where somebody with psychedelic assisted therapy can last a year doing therapy versus five years um yeah. that's pretty huge and we talked a little bit about kind of the use of ssris every day in comparison to when you look at psychedelics so it's not to say that you would have you would take psychedelics, have your preparation integration, and then you would never have to go back to it. But it's not something that you would take every day for 20 years either. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. So like one of the examples that I try to explain to people, and this is again, just my my opinion, but from what how I understand how psychedelics, Mm -hmm. but more specifically psilocybin is, I always tend to explain to people when when you're taking SSRIs, let's say, okay, you have this box and it's creating, you know, 10 serotonins Mm -hmm. and then something really awful happens to you. There's an injury that happens, traumatic experience happens, and all of a sudden there's a crack in that box. So you're not quite the same, right? You're only creating, let's say, five serotonin Um, and then SSRIs comes in and block right thank you this is helpful Mm -hmm. but the concern we tend to have is okay well you have these well what happens when you're when you stop ssris right when you stop those medications this goes away right because the crack's still there um so the way that i explain to my clients is you know when we incorporate or integrate or or invite psilocybin or psychedelics that works at the box Right. It's not there to compensate for you. It's there to work with you. Yeah. So it, it, it works as the box of really looking at, OK, is there a way to to maybe mend that wound? Right. Mm-hmm. So that eventually in companion. Right. And I, I, I really emphasize on that companionship because I really don't think that psychedelics alone mm-hmm. can heal. I think there needs to be that that natural process of human connection as yeah. well. I think it's a it's a companionship to that. Uh, but with talk therapy or any other modalities of therapy that can help you to get back, it's almost like rehabilitation, right? When we when we think about physio or occupational yeah. therapists, like you're working to get this back online to your 10. So that means that eventually when you get to the point where you're like, you know what, where I'm at is good, then it's like, okay, you're, you know, I, I, I no longer, you no longer serve me for that purpose mm-hmm. anymore. And it can be an, it can be a healthy, I'm done. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and the beauty of this, and I've seen it in my clients is you don't need to start from scratch. So if let's say six months a line or a year down the line, you're like, you know what, I, I, something has happened and I'm, I'm unraveling. I, I, maybe I could benefit from getting back on the protocol. Mm-hmm a lot of them have reported that they don't feel like they're starting back up. They feel like within that, that beginning of the protocol, it really helps them to go where they last ended. Like they, Mm -hmm. they just go from there. Right. Um, and with my clients that have talked about not liking the symptoms of the difference pharmaceuticals, let's, let's use SSRIs as an example, um, and then removing it and, and awful withdrawals, but then going back on them, they feel like they're starting up again, Mm -hmm. right? So there's always this constant needing the body to readjust. So that's that beautiful, like natural process of just the body's also sort of resonating of, you know, this is good for me because Mm -hmm. I'm starting, I'm not starting from scratch trying to calibrate again. It's like, it's, it's that companionship almost like just, it sticks there. Mm -hmm. Right. And and it really creates true healing instead of just artificially um, compensating. Yeah. Yeah, If that makes sense. Um, I just want to mention for those of you that, for those of you that might be listening and they don't know what SAP is just to say it's special access program. So um, in Canada, there is a way to, provide access to psychedelics um, going through Health Canada, and it's usually something that's more life-threatening. So we've seen PTSD, 
and we've seen treatment resistant depression for example end of life distress so those are some of the things we've seen and how do yeah. you how do you feel now when you're going through SAP what kinds of um, indications are you looking at for your population yeah so right now I'm actually exploring SAPs and the exemption yeah. so the exemption through the homeless population oh, okay. but the SAPs through the racialized trauma oh, okay. lens so for me, the things that I'm really looking at is number one, looking at the literature, because I think it's also in some ways, unfortunately, it's a business case of trying to ex yes. e express and, and prove why racial trauma is a life threatening yes. uh, circumstance or could create uh, resistance to other treatments. Mm -hmm. um, so it's looking at the literature review around post traumatic stress, looking around also some of the literature around uh, racialization and, 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 and mm -hmm. you know, uh, enslavement and colonial colonialism and, and how that has impacted at a psychological level. I also look at different scales. So the skills that I use, and it's always, I always continue to search and look at what are the best ways to represent mm -hmm. what I'm trying to, to um, articulate when I am applying for these is um, absolutely the adverse childhood experience uh, scale that helps not only to understand whether there's complex post-traumatic stress or developmental trauma there, mm -hmm. but it also gives us an indication of intergenerational trauma. Yeah. So that is universal to all. Um, and then I also look at uh, the Watts connectedness scale. Mm -hmm. I think that that on its own, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty impressive yeah. of seeing a scale that is universal that way, that you don't need much to put a racial lens on there. Mm -hmm. um, I've found myself felt not needing to change the language and yeah. it resonating mm -hmm. with white bodies and racial bodies alike. So I, I you know, shout out to, to Watts for that yes. one. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and that really helps me to understand how they perceive the world around them, right? How connected that they feel. And, and that plays a huge role in, in life threatening because, and again, this is my opinion, but coming from a humanistic lens and, and thinking about like Abraham Maslow, the hierarchy of need, like a sense of belonging is a very important aspect to our survival as human beings. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have that, then yeah, illness will manifest itself in different ways and long term, not immediately. But to me, that is a that is a life risk, mm -hmm. not being connected to the world around you. So that what's the scale really helps with that. Uh, I've I've kind of dabbled and, and grabbed a couple different statements, and I I don't know if I don't think the scale exists, but I it's an ancestral questionnaire. That's what I call it, mm -hmm. and and it does ask specific questions around um, ancestral background to have an understanding if there is ancestral trauma, right? Yeah. That lineage, and you know, ancestral trauma. We tend to think, yeah, black, indigenous, and racialized bodies, but there is also ancestral trauma within white bodies as well. So when we think about you know the Middle Ages and asking the question like what brought you to turtle island in the first place yeah. like what were your ancestors fleeing violence so that really helps to understand if there is that component there um and then finally just all together i think it's also just honoring that we all have historical trauma and and in that lens i use like historical trauma to me it's is human history mm -hmm. when we talk about it and i think that as human beings there's there's a lot of trauma there um so those are the skills that i do utilize that's really helpful um i know like you know we we could use those anxiety and and and, yeah. and depression skills and things like that but as a traumatologist for me it's 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 almost like it's inevitable that there's anxiety and, mm -hmm. and depression there um, who wouldn't have anxiety and depression um, suffering from from traumatic yeah. experiences, yet alone racial experience. So, um, so yeah, so the those are really the skills that have really helped me to paint a really beautiful picture. And, and also recently integrating uh, the racial trauma uh, assessment by by Dr. Williams and, mm -hmm. and, and her team. So that's been really helpful to paint a picture of how racial trauma is impacting them today. Yeah. So with all of those, it really paints a pretty clear picture of, of a timeline of like, these are all the multiple ways that this individual has been inflicted by the wounds of, of, of trauma, mm -hmm. but of, of racial trauma. Um, and then that really helps to, to make the point of, yeah, this is not only a severe and persistent, uh, but this is also a life threatening um, because, you know, the, the data is there, mm -hmm. uh, regardless mm -hmm. if someone wants to be subjective or not. Um, history, history showcases, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> we even see it today uh, that history is repeating itself. Yeah. 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 We kind of talked a little bit about um, 
the I mean, we, everyone's all psyched, you know, psychedelics and therapy and everybody wants to be a therapist and everything. But we talked about kind of the potential harms, too, of not doing this mm -hmm. right, especially potential harms with racialized communities. So can you want to talk a little bit about how there's potential harms that this is not done correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to, how do we, I'll just go with it. And if I'm not answering it, you let yeah. me know. But yeah, so... You know, talking about again earlier when we talked about the importance and the difference between racialized individuals in a therapeutic yeah. setting versus non-racialized, so not like white bodied versus non-white body. When we're talking about psychedelic pieces, like we're really holding space for quite a vulnerable individual because, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, psychedelics is a, is a dissociative. And if we are not like if as a white body therapist, we haven't done our work in terms of racial privilege, in terms of what we represent, whether we are, you know, male or female, or that we are just as human beings and the, the historical lineage to that, um, we often forget that even though that we might mean well, the racialized body may see us in a different way. And we are in a, in a power dynamic there mm -hmm. where as a white body, you are going to be holding space for someone that historically has been oppressed by what you represent, yeah. what you've inherited, yeah. I guess, is the better word and term. Um, so real, real risk can happen there. Like I self disclosure, I have my own experience that if it wasn't for what I knew and being a traumatologist, I could say, yeah, there, I experienced racial trauma in my own psychedelic experience, mm -hmm. right? Of indi when individuals um, are not able to bring their stamina, right? And there's fragility there. And, and you know, white fragility is real. Um, and it can cause harm in, in different ways, such as empathy withdrawal. So because I'm so uncomfortable about this subject, because it, it constructs or it, it, it moves my body in a way that's not comfortable, I may withdraw from holding space. Mm -hmm. But to that racialized body or anybody, looking at that, they might coin, did I do something wrong? Yeah. Or they might be like, it might also perceive as gaslighting, mm -hmm. right? So they might feel like doubting themselves, like, was it really a big deal? Um, and should I just dismiss myself more? Mm -hmm. So that can be very harmful um, because racial gaslighting is real. Um, as racialized bodies, we racially gaslight ourselves as well yeah. because we're constantly inundated with messages of like, is it really we real what we feel? Is there a lot of truth to our stories or are we just catastrophizing it or just, you know, making a big deal out of nothing? So those are some of the harms that can take place. Um, so again, like not knowing your own privilege, not knowing your own um, lineage of what you represent uh, can really, that, that, that can't be that can't be part mm -hmm. when you're working with psychedelics and you're working in that realm uh, because for that racialized body most likely that's going to come up for them because that is part of their story that's also part of their needs to heal um if if you don't have the stamina and you're not able to hold space for that that is another harm that takes place so not just empathy withdrawal but as human beings, this is what we call transference, where um, the better, the easiest way that I explain it to people is when um, when you have this feeling that you vibe with someone, you're like, oh, there's like this this connection mm -hmm. here. That's transference. Yeah. Right. So as human beings, as mammals, as we are, there's there's different language. It's not just speech. It's also the the vibe that we set out. It's that that connection, that non visible connection that happens in the therapeutic space as well. So if you're dealing with your own baggage of not having done your work and all those mm -hmm. things, then someone needs to hold that yeah right so if it's not the therapist it goes on to that racialized body um and that's very harmful because when we think about 400 years 500 years ago that's all we've been doing mm -hmm. as racialized communities is holding spaces because white bodies are still trying to figure out how do i hold this difficultness and mm. and uh, it's not to blame and I, I, i'm not putting blame onto to white bodies it is a traumatic stress response on their end that you know because of the racial privilege, they've not needed to hold space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they, they've not needed yeah. to. So it's almost like they, they may not have that capacity. So those are some of the ways that can really cause, unfortunately, it's not a direct, uh, but it's a very indirect, but it's a very psychological. And that, that is just as harmful because it leaves the racialized body not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, 
for 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 those who are racialized that are listening to this it's 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 almost like that microaggression it's it's like that aggression it's like you're always questioning like did i do something wrong am i am i imagining this mm-hmm. and you're ruminating right so it doesn't end for them in that session it continues to ripple right yeah. it continues and if if just like trauma if you can't process it if it's stuck it's going to come out in different ways and that's where lateral violence happens so that racialized body may not say something in that that particular situation because they don't feel safe mm-hmm. but they're probably going to blow through a loved one yeah. or themselves right so those are the risks that 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 come with you know being so excited and maybe not necessarily having that in check um i think to your other question about how everybody's really just excited in general and and racialized or not there's also that piece of like how set and setting and the vulnerability there is really important. So when we think about touch, right. And, and consent yes, um, we'll about and, that. and yeah. And just understanding that you are dealing with a different altered state of mind. Mm-hmm. This is not the same of what we learned in school mm-hmm. at all. You know, this is not someone who is, you know, consciously capable of making those logical decisions and I always think the flip of the lid like this isn't happening this is where they're at it's nothing but emotion Mm -hmm. so it's really about being mindful of you really are holding power there and there is a choice of abusing that power or using that power and if you are not intentional and really understanding the power that you hold um in an in the inevitably and 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 not maliciously but you are going to be causing you are going to abuse that power you know and even if it's coming from a position of i just want to help um then you've you've taken away from from your client right you've made it about mm-hmm. yourself instead of really listening to what's 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 really happening there and and what they need um so it's not for everybody, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I get that people are excited. I get that they want to help. Um, at the same time, like it, it does take a seriousness of understanding that this is a totally different ball game when it comes to what we've what we've been taught in our therapeutic modalities. Yeah, I think it's yeah. always interesting because my background, I'm not a therapist, but I'm a nurse and I worked in a merge worked in mental health. And it's always uh, interesting to me when someone's like, I'm so excited. I want to learn to be a therapist and I want to be in psychedelics because they think it's just this fun experience, but they don't realize how impactful it is when you're sitting with someone in that, holding that space and you're, you know, you're hearing the trauma, you're taking that in, Mm -hmm. you know, there may be suicidal tendencies, like you're taking all that in. It's not a fun Hey, what, look, listen to what happened to me today. That's not, it's, you know, you're, you, you yeah. really are taking that in yourself. And, and sometimes I need like yeah. a couple of days just to, <laughs> just to process so like here's trauma myself. trauma is real, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I, you know, it's interesting yeah. when people think this is just this fun, exciting thing. It's, you really need to be trained, well-trained therapist or even a healthcare professional to be able to know how to Absolutely. manage things and, and manage that patient. And you're there for them a hundred percent. It's not you, it's, yes. you, you know, you need to kind of be so present in that space. And you have your own yeah. preparation, yeah. right? Because like, you're really stepping into needing to be there a hundred percent. Um, and at the end of the day as well, I think that's where I really, and, and that's why I do my vicarious trauma work that I do because, you know, frontline workers, healthcare, yeah. therapists yeah. alike, like you also have to make sure that you know your own trauma map right that you know the baggage that you still have that might be you you don't have to have everything in check like let's be honest here like i didn't become a traumatologist just because it's cool like there's obviously (laughs) some baggage there and this is this is my healing journey but i'm aware of that and i'm intentional Mm -hmm. about it right so it's really about the intentionality that even if you have baggage really that very careful intentionality we cannot bring yes. that into that yeah. space um, because that can that can cause harm. And then it's also about the intentionality of really understanding your identity. And I think there's a privilege mm-hmm. there as well that I want to name because there's some people that that they may still not know what their their full identity is. But it's just again just being mindful that there's a lot of moving parts in that. And you're right, people will 
express their traumas. There will be, you know, that vulnerability of going into hyper hypo arousal and suicidality mm-hmm. will be part of those conversations. So it's about asking yourself, you know, how comfortable am I with yes. those conversations and being able to hold those spaces, right? Um, and maybe in your standard therapeutic process, you can get away with not talking about mm-hmm. those things. But in this space, um, that creates harm by not talking mm-hmm. about it. Um, and no matter how uncomfortable it is for you, I hate this, but it's not it about is, you. It, yeah, exactly. It's 100% about the, the client that's right there that is putting their trust in you and, and saying, you're holding space for me, for me to feel safe enough to unravel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then to and then to put the pieces back together. Yeah. yeah. Um, one yeah. of the things we talked about before as well, just shifting the conversation on the dosing side of it, is microdosing. Now, it, when we talked yes. about it's surprising that there's not a lot of you know, research data around the benefits of microdosing. I was yeah. so surprised. So, um, yeah. We'd love yeah. to hear your experience with your patients uh, with microdosing. Yeah. So as much as everybody's really excited about, you know, journeys and like from one gram to seven gram mm-hmm. and all these things, I've actually found the excitement and the benefits in the microdosing world. Um, so what I've noticed is that not only is it manageable where it really helps individuals to feel empowered and to be like, I'm taking my own health mm-hmm. in, 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 in my hands and I'm, I'm really getting to understand and heal myself right and and to a certain point with the companionship of 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 course you know professionals and Mm -hmm. and all of that stuff um but it's been really interesting to see how um how really easy it is to integrate in in that therapeutic space and and being able to see how not only does it benefit the client but it also benefits the therapist that it it is a companion Mm -hmm. for us right it's it's a really helpful tool to help you know um, massage maybe certain areas that uh, clients might not necessarily be resistant to, but they may have blind spots where they're like, no, this this does not feel mm-hmm. safe. So it's really helped to move things along um, in terms of elevated dosage as, as well. So like for me, I do a lot of parts work. So that's been also super helpful uh, that when we're really diving into those difficult conversations, having that companionship helps to ease it not to say that it's easy conversations mm-hmm. but the flow continues those parts aren't showing up you know the protector's not showing up and saying uh-uh we're not talking mm-hmm. about it the protector's like okay well what what is this really about I'll, i'm 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 curious yeah. right it brings curiosity um and the other piece as well is i'm still amazed by that that how such a low dose can have such a remarkable impact so even to what we talked about in terms of shaving off those yeah. four years, I'm talking about this is on microdosing. Oh, wow. So I want to I want to clarify okay. that. So that's not even based on having had like a journey experience. That those are those are the observations that I've seen of my my patients and my clients being on on those mm-hmm. microdose protocols. Um, I don't know if you had a more specific question. I I, I feel like maybe I'm not answering no, that, no, yeah, that um, question. You, you're seeing definitely yeah. benefits with microdosing. Yeah, that was the that was the question. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and I think that that, you know, if 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 as a it, within the therapeutic world, if if we focus that the different modalities that that can offer, I think that that gives more flexibility in how yeah. we utilize psychedelics, that it doesn't always have to be this big thing, right? This big journey and making these big discoveries that, you know, a little bit can go a, a long way. Um, I found in my practice, I've been able to. Um, invite my clients into three different processes from those microdose, you know, from 25 to 75 milligrams to those more elevated dosage, 250 to 500, um, using that in terms of uh, individual therapy, uh, doing more specific trauma processing, and also our nature base. So being able to go outside in nature and, and incorporate that and inviting that not altered mind state, but, you know, quieting yeah. that ego down so that we can really see the beauty of what nature, what the world and what being connected mm-hmm. can really bring to you. Um, and, you know, people talk about like, uh, you know, shower, forest showering, like just really being immersed in it. I just feel like psychedelics really help to amplify that mm-hmm. experience and just really helps to... Um, uh, refresh or maybe recalibrate the the unbalancedness of of being in the hustle and the bustle of of society mm-hmm. right and of uh, of yeah. all of that yeah and i'm going to talk a little bit about um just so people don't realize that you have 
like actual treatment protocols that you follow. So it's not just kind of random, maybe take this, maybe take yes. that, maybe we'll do this. No. <laughs> There's definitely like these <laughs> yeah, treatment yeah. protocols. And you talked a lot about, you know, that assessment that you do and in, in the training and the education that you do and sharing those publications and, you know, peer reviewed articles. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about your, your treatment protocols. Yeah, so my treatment protocols, I really try to make it so it fits the lifestyle mm -hmm. of the individual. So there are certain individuals when they're stepping into this, they're unsure, they really don't want to jeopardize perhaps their mm -hmm. workplace or um, being able to manage their everyday responsibilities and duties. Um, so I actually work with three different types of protocols to to help with that, whether it's a protocol that helps for them to really focus on the weekend and setting the intention, knowing that they don't have the stress of work really helps sort of that, in some ways, the placebo mm -hmm. effect of okay I don't have that I not taking it and it has to go well it's sort of like I can take it in my own time I can kind of go slowly and and really step into it um so yeah so my protocols are very specific I'm I'm quite like the stickler for like you gotta follow yeah. the protocol if you want to see mm -hmm. the results I've had circumstances where people have kind of gotten too excited sort of what we talked about everybody's excited for the psychedelics and they've they've not necessarily listened quite well not that that made a risk but it did make their experience mm -hmm. challenging because they did not take those steps right um so yeah so with my protocols i do um i i have looked at different types i do the two days on one day off three days on mm -hmm. four days off uh, four days on three days off but it's very much dependent on um their right. lifestyle what responsibilities they have their comfort level and also their history of psychedelic mm -hmm. usage as well so that will really help um i do check-ins as well so i use usually do a check-in when they first started um i will do a check-in um at the uh, the 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 first day that they take, they begin their protocol. I will also do a check-in uh, when they are on their mm -hmm. off day. So let's say as an example, if it's a three days on, four days off, uh, at the first day I will do a check-in and then I'll do a check-in on their on that mm -hmm. fourth day when they, they have yeah. not been on um, the, pro, uh, the u utilizing the psychedelic or the microdose. And then I will check again at the end of the off day because I'm really interested of observing how do they do without the psilocybin because for me it's just as important that they don't build a codependency because a lot of it is is their mm -hmm. mindset so i want to make sure that they continue on on that mindset so that the medicine can continue being just that that mm -hmm. companion um, and then based on that we will then adjust we will increase um, or decrease depending on what their symptoms are uh, once there's really that that momentum going then i start checking in less and less and we start really doing more processing work so even in the beginning of the protocol, we're still doing preparation mm -hmm. work um, because, you know, the idea for it is when I begin my protocols, it's really to um, manage symptoms uh, in preparation to doing the trauma, to doing the actual trauma work, right? Um, so, so that's also something that I don't think I, I, well, at least for me, the studies I've read, I'm not, I'm not seeing that talked mm -hmm. about a lot, that how are you actually using the protocol? And it, a lot of times they're really looking at, well, how effective is it and how safe is it? But uh, my lens is always like how, how like in, in terms of healing, how effective is it in the sense of how does it companion with what mm -hmm. we do, yeah. right? Because as, as therapists, I really, to me, it should be a companion. We shouldn't need to change the mold of how we practice. This should be helping to right. to to um, mm -hmm. to benefit or to amplify mm -hmm. the work that we're doing um, in order to help our our communities. Yeah, um, I've also had you know there's there's circumstances where I do protocols where I I incorporate um, cannabis mm -hmm. as well. So really looking at how psychedelics and 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 i guess it's chemistry in some ways of how do we amplify certain things and how do we help for it to to go longer or to to bring one particular thing down so that they can really um experience that psychedelic experience as well so it is very much mm -hmm. a science mm -hmm. to it so i i never thought that as a as a therapist i'd be doing that my son that particular yeah. type of science the chemistry science would come into the mix but it's really uh it's really exciting but even more reason to say you can't just you know it's not just the excitement of like yeah okay i'll do a training and now i can do psychedelics like 
it, there's a science yeah. to yeah. this, you yeah. know? Yeah. Now, yeah. You, you, when we, during the discussion, we talked about CBD and we talked about psilocybin. Mm -hmm. Are there other psychedelics yeah. that your patients are kind of seeking, whether that's MDMA or ayahuasca or is there anything else that you're, you have experience with with your patients? Yeah, so I do have a couple patients that uh, they've explored uh, LS yeah. uh, LSD um, yeah. as well as um, ayahuasca as well. So those those have been the 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 I guess the four. Well, if I use cannabis as the fourth, I know it's not a, a psychedelic, but it's mm -hmm. it's you know it's a, mm -hmm. a cousin, right? It's a very close yeah. uh, a cousin to it. So yeah, so so far it's been a lot of just um, more of integration mm -hmm. work with that uh, because they would either come in and say, yeah, I just I did do that over the weekend or I've done it in the past or I have a journal based on those experiences. I'd like right. to see how can we integrate it. So in those particular cases, I've done way more integration work than preparation okay. work, um, even though that my training uh, gives me, you know, access to being able to, to do the work with uh, ayahuasca and, and peyote, LSD, MDMA, uh, ketamine, as well as psilocybin. Um, but in saying that, for me, it's also that ancestral lens that I really want to honor that medicine. To me, ayahuasca is not part of my ancestral mm -hmm. lineage, and it's certainly not part of anything that we need to appropriate or, or take part. But if I do have individuals that it is part, so like uh, some of my indigenous um, clients and things like that, absolutely, it's about how do we really help to bring appreciation and, and honoring mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, so, and, you know, there is that ketamine piece as well. That's to me, it's more a little bit more mm -hmm. man-made than, than the natural piece. But I do, I do a lot of integration, but I also do a lot of preparation with that. Um, but currently for me, my, my interest really lies in, in psilocybin and, and cannabis work. So I, I do have a network of support of clinics mm -hmm. out there because there's multiple yeah. clinics, ketamine clinics yeah. out there. So um, I do refer uh, to them. Uh, until that my my clinic in April, mm -hmm. knock on wood, will will be operating, but we'll be really focusing on on psilocybin and cannabis. Yeah, right. That's exciting. Yeah. So when is where's your um, new yeah. clinic going to be in April? Uh, so it's going to be in uh, oh, in excellent. Halifax in the North End. So I'm really excited because in the North End, just like you yeah. asked the question about, you know, why the East Coast, the North End is very much mm -hmm. historical. That is where Africville is. That is where, you know, the Halifax explosion for those. Yeah. I don't know if, you know, our listeners know about all that, but Google it, check it out. Um, so there's a lot of mm -hmm. history uh, there. So it's another like, I just I'm like, yeah, thank you, universe. Like you're really, you know, dropping some some gifts for me. So um, I'm really grateful to have found that space and being able to really start this particular journey um, for for building an infrastructure that really can um, invite that psychedelic piece, but in a way that that is also um, in uh, that can compete with our existing s structure. But but doing a little bit, hopefully it'll be it'll be better than what we what mm -hmm. we have here. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. And is it being built just to help m support more of that psychedelic assisted therapy? So for me, like my, my, my background, I, you know, I have Brie mm -hmm. Love Counseling, which is all about counseling. And in my career, I really got to really understand that trauma is not just about talk therapy. It's not just in the thinking brain. So this clinic is actually with our, our new venture, Brie mm -hmm. Love Wellness, and it's a multidisciplinary. So we're talking about nutrition. We're talking about massage therapy, yoga, um, naturopathic medicine, as well as psychedelic and, and therapy. So we're looking at the whole body, right? the whole person. Uh, so this clinic is to accommodate the, the infrastructure it is to accommodate the psychedelic uh, process. So we have literally a separate space where um, the, the clinic can continue to operate and, and not bother those that are going mm -hmm. through experiences. Um, but for me, the pillars that we are really focusing on is racial trauma, uh, adverse childhood experience and vicarious trauma. Um, so that's really who that we mm -hmm. are there to service. Um, it's really to create like also racialized mental health yeah. infrastructure. It doesn't exist. There's no infrastructure in our healthcare right now that is prioritizing or is intentionally saying like at the end of the day, like this is to, we are, this is infrastructure for racialized uh, healing. Um, as much as my clinic is open to everyone, um, I make it very known that the priority is racialized yeah. bodies. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is something that's really important because a lot of my racialized clients, a lot of, 
you know, the 11 years of work and observing and working in organizations, mm -hmm. right, and all that stuff, racialized bodies don't feel safe in, in the mm -hmm. infrastructures we have, the, the number of cases of medical trauma and all these things. So for me, it's, it, it's an honor to be able to offer not just the therapeutic space, but an actual infrastructure that honors safety and accessibility for our racialized communities and honors safety and accessibility for those who have been impacted by racial trauma, by adverse mm -hmm. childhood experiences and by, by CARES trauma, so our frontline workers alike. Uh, you're yeah. doing such important work. Especially, I Thank mean, you, it, you yeah. know, it's, it's hard kind of being the forefront of this. It, you know, you're not just doing psychedelic assisted therapy, you're building a framework to <laughs> to kind of look at an interdisciplinary approach to, you know, racialized communities, which is huge. And it's Absolutely. like that you don't have a yeah. um, something to benchmark, really. You kind of have to build it on your <laughs> own and figure it out. <laughs> The benchmark is the 11 yes. years of clinical work Your and, benchmark, you know, the, yeah. the, my life, yeah. my life so yeah. far. Right. And, and listening to other voices yeah. that that have experienced similar things and who are just they're exhausted. Right. They're tired. And um, some are, are becoming angry mm -hmm. about it. Right. They're they're yeah. they're done. So um, I you know, for me, it's it's a humbling experience to be able to offer hope mm -hmm. or to at least offer a mm -hmm. choice. To me, that's yeah. huge. Just offering choice that now they can choose, you know, if I'm ready, then I have a choice that I can I can step into my healing in that way. So you're you're right. It is a lot of work <laughs> when there's not a benchmark. And I'll say it. It's a lot of work being also black in this community because in that type of, of system, because there's not a lot of me around, you know, when I step mm -hmm. into a space of, you know, people who have that same education as me, um, our identities are not yeah. the same at all. So that that's an extra piece that that is there. But I, I say that's my superpower as well, because that's the piece that allows me to be in the system and outside mm -hmm. the system, you know, so to me, my blackness is what um, allows me to not have competition yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because there's that piece that people will never understand unless they mm -hmm. are racialized. So that that's how I also twist it into that's the resilience there. That's that's why we can be mm -hmm. successful in that. Yeah. Right. Um, what I'm going to ask yeah. you too is just what, what are the big takeaways you like our audience to kind of step away from this podcast with? <laughs> I'm throwing that question at you. Ooh, There's wow. so much here to unpack. Yeah. I'm what? just like, what are yeah. some of the, the key messaging that you kind of want to be like, think about this, this, and this? <laughs> yeah. Um, healing is possible. Yeah. Um, Like for, yeah, so healing is possible in terms of therapy, like it's really important to do your due diligence and to really recognize how your identity and the baggage you hold plays mm -hmm. into the therapeutic space. Um, and, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to be radical, mm -hmm. to think mm -hmm. big and to, to take, you know, healing in your own hands in a, in a, in yeah. a safe way, you know, um, and, you know, do, do your research as well. Like, don't just pick the first person that says, yeah, yeah, I right. do psychedelic work. Like ask for credential. Don't be afraid to, to ask questions and to challenge your therapist and to making sure that they're, they're, they're also doing their due diligence, but I'm sure there's so much yeah. other <laughs> takeaways. The other takeaway um, <laughs> listen to this podcast a couple more times. I yeah. Think we need more, more of you. That's one takeaway. <laughs> Yes, that's a takeaway. We need more of me, but uh, maybe not too many because uh, I don't want. Yeah, I'm I'm a lot. I'm a lot yeah. to when I walk into a space. I'm a lot to to yeah. hold. So, but yes, it'd be pretty. It'd be pretty awesome to to have a couple more unicorns mm -hmm. in this in mm -hmm. this community in this field. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kayla. <laughs> is is there anything else you want to touch on? That's really it. I want to thank you, Sabrina. And I'm so super stoked that this is the first relaunch and, and what better way to really show the commitment to yes. accessibility and diversity and inclusion than to, you know, amplify. So I, I, I want to I want to thank you for for making space for the racialized community and having this conversation. I'm beyond like I don't even have words to express how um, appreciative I am that you you see my work and, and that you're giving me a platform to share my work. And I I want to tell the audience like even though you know we're we're having these chats like 
reach out to me if you mm-hmm. have questions, if you want some feedback, if you want to to have a conversation. Um, my door is always open, and I, I I would love to to have some of the audiences uh, wanting to yeah. continue the the discussion further. So I, I I totally welcome that. And if you're in the East Coast, like yeah, stop, stop, by. stop by, have a chat. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll uh, we'll have quite the uh, the conversation. So yeah, that that's about it. But I want to thank Maps Canada for giving me this opportunity and. Uh, I love I love being part of the board yeah. too. Like we love you know, being part representing of the board. <laughs> and yeah, and just bringing access and yeah. really having a voice for racialized yeah. community. I I can't emphasize that more. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Yeah, so thank, thank you so much, you. Kayla. Bye. Yeah. All right. Take Bye. care. Bye.